welcome back to another episode of the Modern Game Podcast. Um, this week, we're going to be talking about the return of Champion Asia. <laughs> no, who am I kidding? Um, we're going to be talking about sentiment because... It's been a roller coaster the last week. Um, from the highs of hashtag when prem, we appear to like it's pivoted very, very quickly. Um, there does appear to be a few managers that are very upset, a few managers that are selling out. But I think what you always have to remember is, you know who you follow and the potential echo chamber aspect of it. I think what was really interesting is a couple of the managers that I saw sell were all friends with each other. So I feel like there is a huge element of groupthink and people sort of validating, you know, sort of self-validating opinions in groups and we've seen quite quickly a sentiment change has resulted in a bunch of users undercutting each other, trying to make quick sales because there's been a you know, bit of panic in the market. Um, I feel that's kind of a quick TLDR, but how, how are you feeling, Josh? What's, what's your sort of perspective on, on all things so rare sentiment in the last week? Um, yeah, I was saying to you before, before we start recording, I, I might need a bit of a helping hand through this episode of, uh, of Modern Game as I haven't really been keeping up with too much of the, the Twitter posts regarding selling and so rare being in the dumps and whatever, just because uh, to be honest, I've become a little, um, tired of them, I guess. Um, so I do, I think the, the group you're referring to is like the, the French clique, right? The Joe Bettman and, uh, Magic Medi and these guys, which, uh, you know, have have got out of so rare, all power to them. Um, well done. I imagine, like I think I was saying to you in a chat this week, I, uh, Medi seems to have sold his Gary to Super Usman at you know like sixty percent or whatever. But um, the amount of money that he'll have made from the platform, I think he was the first two hundred user. So the amount of money that he'll have made from the platform, like he probably doesn't really care. Like he makes a clean exit and and gets out when he thinks it's the right time to do so. Um, so you know that that's absolutely fine. Um, but from like the limited amount of tweets I have seen on on the topic, it I just I've been like a little disappointed with how everyone is viewing it. It seems like a bit of an overreaction, um, which is like my personal opinion. Um, and I think like this might be a little bit of a a strange episode because I think our thinking, or maybe it normally is, but I think our thinking is quite aligned on this. I guess. Um, so, but. And yeah, that might not like we might just be agreeing with each other, but um, but I think we like need to the... bring in somebody with a completely negative yeah, yeah, viewpoint exactly. just to you yeah. know, go full BBC on this and yeah. make sure that we bring balance <laughs> to the argument. But yeah, and I just think that people I know prices are going down, and that's that is happening, and I get that if people have invested a lot of money in the product at time where the sentiment was a lot higher and prices were a lot higher, that this can like look depressing and can make you feel bad about it. And I know there's some, there's some people in a few chats that we're in that are like, you know, I've put in X amount of money and now it's down to this amount of money. Um, and you know, that, that is absolutely true. And obviously that that's, that's the case. But the thing that I always say like about crypto and any of these types of things, you know, I've been in this space like three years now or something is like you, you only, you only lose when you exit the, the product you're trying, you know, that you, that you're in currently. I think that's the same with Sora. Like when way back when Ethereum had the first spike, or even Bitcoin to some extent, like had had its first initial spike and then like crashed massively. Like obviously people that bought at the top were in say negative equity on their asset for a long time. But if they held it and just carried on holding it, you know, obviously they, they did a lot better. Um in the long run. And I'm not sure if that's going to be the case with so rare, but it certainly feels like we're seeing a lot of knee jerk reactions on the basis of, or the thinking of, Oh, you know, we've had a peak and now everything's just going to carry on going down like indefinitely or forever. Right. Um, and I just, with the way the platform is set up and the new user influx into the platform, because I think like we can see that users are going up, right. But prices are coming down. Yeah. So more, 
low entry users i i suppose um and yeah you know we don't i think i saw like a tweet or something that somebody said that they or it might have even been medi or betman or one of the guys that was selling and said they don't think that they've seen like a proper whale into the game in the last six months mm-hmm. um and yeah you know all these things considered but you know i think there has to be at some point unless this product does just die in which case i'll hold my hands up and say i've been wrong um that we do have some you know, with new users coming in, we have some area of rebound, right? And, you know, if you do not sell your gallery at this stage, you, you, you do not lose, or, you know, at least you don't, you don't equate that loss value. Yeah. And I think the really interesting factor about this as well, for me, is that you can compare it to crypto cycles. Like you said, you know, you said like Mm. people that bought Bitcoin high, and then, you know, they're holding, waiting for it to rise again. The factor that is unique to so rare is that these cards still have utility. So, like, as an example, yes, my cards have lost value in the last week, but I'm still with rewards, you know, rewards day coming in a couple of hours. I think I'm getting four, maybe five rewards this week, including one T1. So it's not simply a case of, oh, no, like, I have to wait until the, the, the card goes back up to the value I paid for it before I can sell. It's about thinking about that asset and how you can use it within the game. And, you know, looking at some players like, um, you know, very, very established players that have got, you know, settled teams, lots of experience of playing the game, you know, they've they've got high XP on their cards, you know, that that's going to open up an opportunity for somebody else to step into that space. You know, so I haven't come out and said, oh, you know, by the way, ladies and gents, uh, we've cut rewards by 50%. Um, and there's far few people that can, far fewer number of users that can win. I think we are seeing an element of frustration around the reduction in ETH that's um, injected into the market. I was educated on this uh, this week because when I was talking about it, um, I was like, you know, of course the ETH payouts were going to drop. I think they've dropped further than Sura had maybe predicted that they would. But what somebody then pointed out is that I think Nicholas had tweeted that their goal was not to reduce overall the amount of ETH and that they would be monitoring the situation. So I think there's a lot of people that are really frustrated in saying, oh, well, you know, you said ETH wouldn't drop, but, you know, ETH payouts have dropped. So, but also they said that they would monitor the situation and adjust accordingly. So what have we had now? I think three game weeks of ETH payouts. Only two yeah. weekends, we like three Somewhere. game weeks. Is in like we had the midweek, like the yeah. first one that it was introduced in. Like I think I had one was player that was eligible to play in that entire week. Right. It was a really weird week. So you know, it's not smart to make business decisions based on two weeks of data. Yeah. So I do have faith that they will react accordingly. Will they pay out as much ETH as before? You know, equivalent in dollar amount. I, I, I'm not sure they will. Will they pay out more than they've currently paid out by adjusting the competition mechanics around the CAF 240? I actually have faith that they will. And, you know, when you sort of come back to the point about, you know, perceived overreaction, I think you and I probably have a similar perspective on this because we are fortunate in the sense of you know personal circumstances dictate that we do not need to sell yeah which means that you know we can sort of look at it and say okay cool my, you know the gallery value is going down but you know the fundamental question that you you have to ask yourself is is do you believe that you know so rare will cease to exist because I, I you know don't get me wrong it's not a positive thing but like volatility in value I think it's just something that in the world, it happens. You know, currencies fluctuate, uh, you know, cryptocurrencies fluctuate. The value of things change. 
I believe the change in the last week is far more drastic than I or probably anyone would have expected. Yeah. But for me, I'm only concerned if I feel that the value of my holding is going to go to zero, as in, you know, so rare ceases to exist. If you look at the fundamentals behind so rare, they're earning, you know, you can see how much money they're bringing in each month on Crypto Slam. Like, it's many, many millions of dollars. They have very, very strong financial banking backing with the investment of SoftBank. And if you look at how SoftBank behave, typically, they love a follow on investment, you know, so they, they invested in, you know, kept on investing in companies like WeWork, you know, SoftBank yeah. will continue to put money into the projects that they have backed. So in that regard, like, do I, the, the only way you sort of see Sarah going out of business is if they have cash flow issues, if, you know, if they can't afford to pay their bills. Considering the amount of revenue they're bringing in, considering the backing they're bringing in, I actually, at this moment in time, I don't, I don't feel nervous about that at all. Like, I will say that now. Like, I do not feel Sora is going to disappear overnight. Which then it becomes, okay, well, am I worried about my gallery value? Yes, to an extent. As in, like, I want to be aware of, like, what's happening in the market. But I currently don't have any intention of selling and the actions of the last week hasn't changed my opinion on that you know i look at sort of look at it am i enjoying the gameplay yes am i still competitive yes am i yeah. winning rewards yes well then in that case it's for me puts me into that camp of okay we'll just ride out the volatility keep playing because actually Unless I'm selling my gallery, it's not it's not finite. So then when you say, okay, well, you know, we actually had an interesting talk about a fairly adjacent topic the other week about the value of older players. Yeah. And considering how the value of that asset drops, but as long as you are yielding from that asset, then actually, you know, you're you're still bringing an income from it. You know, I was having a, a chat in Discord the other day and I was sort of saying, you know, it's akin to buying a house to rent out if you own the house and you're planning to rent that house out, yes, the value of the house is something that you want to consider. But actually, if you've bought it to rent out, the most important factor is how much rent am I getting? Hmm. So, you know, if I can still use these cards to deliver a return on that investment in the game, then nothing has changed in that regard. Hmm. Yes, the value of the asset that I'm using to win change has changed but i feel like if those assets get so cheap to the point where you can win great rewards with them like i was looking at um uh back of status earlier back of status is in this camp of has had price volatility as a result of the unfortunate situation in turkey where there was some uncertainty around whether the league would or continue or not and then uncertainty around, um, you know, people just undercutting each other and, you know, sort of panicking a little bit with regards to card value. Like a status is now on the market for about 60% of what he was selling for three years. Yeah, I was just looking. His floor is, is 0.58, which is crazy. Insane. <laughs> like, I would be quite confident that I could probably yield back a status's value back in about six to eight weeks. Which, if there's more and more people like myself that start thinking that, then we will eventually reach the bottom, right? And I think this is where it becomes is what sort of happened is we've had this herd mentality of, you know, everyone has their own reasons for wanting to sell. I'm not here to yeah. discuss those or criticize those, but you can look at like what the observed behaviors on the market have been. The observed behaviors have been that prices have reduced. Why have prices reduced? Well, there's been a fair amount of undercutting in order to achieve a sale. What that then creates is a fear that prices will drop further. 
So you have managers going, getting nervous. Maybe this is, you know, highlighted some managers that maybe were considering selling out for a period of time, um, which I'll come back to in a minute because I think there's like a prem aspect to this, which is quite interesting. You may have had managers that were considering selling out for a period of time. Suddenly they see gallery values dropping and they're like, oh, okay, shit, I've got to get out now. They then, in order to secure the sale, drop below last selling price. If you have too, you know, enough of those managers doing the same on the same cards, then you will see a fairly quick price drop. What that then happens is that spooks the buyers who don't want to buy in what is looking like a declining market. But those buyers... You know, particularly the managers that are still active, the managers that are still playing the game. You know, I'd certainly put myself in this camp. Yep. I sort of looking at the prices, thinking, okay, well, what point does this stop? At what point does the trend reverse? And I feel like if the trend does reverse anytime soon, or we see a leveling out, then you see that confidence swing pretty quickly. Because suddenly people are looking at cards like back of status, for example, and going, well, hang on a minute, here was an ETH of three weeks ago. Could he get back up to that? Oh, actually, maybe he could. And then suddenly you see that changing. The example we've seen with this before is when players are rumored to have a transfer. Look at the behavior. Like, And I remember one of the, the brilliant ones was um, Theo Bongonda in the summer. Oh, wow, that was me. Theo Bongonda was linked to Alain. The undercutting happened rapidly and his price like dropped by like, honestly, like it was something stupid, like 80% in like 24 hours. Suddenly, news comes out, says Bongonda's not going to our lane. He might stay at gank. Boom. Price is straight back up because people are piling back in going, oh, actually, no, he's decent if I have him at gank. Yeah, I want, you know, I want that. And the price turned around very, very quickly. And I feel that we are seeing the same effects, but just triggered by different reasons. And I think as well is, you know, you see if you're, a, you know, a manager that's been around and you see established managers, you see managers that are, you know, been playing the game for a while selling out, you're thinking, oh, why are they doing that? Maybe they know something. Maybe I should also sell out. And I think this is where the, the personal circumstances comes in is I think that, you know, for, for me, I'm sort of looking this year, next year, beyond. So I don't mind really if there's sort of volatility in the next 12 months because I don't intend to sell within that time frame. Whereas if you think about if you're someone that said, I might consider selling this year, um, you know, I've spoken to some managers who are talking, you know, that they've they've got a baby on the way. They're buying a house. You know, there's a bunch of life circumstances where someone's saying, you know what, actually, yeah, I could use that money. I, I could I could take the money in my gallery and I could use that for life things. If that's the decision that you have, then that's really sensible. You know, if, you've, if, you, if you're worried about the further drops and that money can be used to improve your quality of life outside of so rare, then it's a no-brainer. But I think that this is where you know, you sort of have that aspect of personal circumstances and fear that's sort of piling into this and, and causing it um, to happen quite quickly. What you may also have is potentially there's been a bunch of managers. Um, a lot of the managers that are selling out that I've seen lived through the Gary Vee boom. Yep. How many of those managers potentially have had thoughts of selling up potentially liquidating and, you know, bringing in a potentially life life changing sum of money to their, their own sort of personal life. And have gone, you know what, I might just wait for the Prem to land. You know, I wonder what's going to happen to prices when the Prem lands. And maybe they've overestimated the positive impact of the Prem. Because if you think about it, when we had the Gary V boom, there were a fraction of the cards that are available today. The reason the prices went up so quick is because uh, demand far outstripped supply. What we are seeing now is we're seeing a steady influx of new users, but because of the amount of supply, we're not seeing that rapid bump 
that we saw, which was honestly massively unsustainable, and a lot of people would have got their fingers burnt back in the in the Gary V um, pub. What is happening now is Soro looks to be acquiring users at a far more sustainable rate, which is good for everyone, except people that were maybe holding on, thinking, "Oh, well, there you are. If we get a bit of a prem bump, then that's it. That's me. I'm cashing out." And if you are someone that sort of said, oh, you know, maybe my gallery value goes up like 10, 20% when, when um, the prem comes, you've set expectations and you've anchored yourself really high. So if you see that going the other way, you're going to think, oh, fuck, you know, I better just take what I better can. Better get out now. Yeah. Better get out now. And that sort of like domino effect, I think, has, has spooked the market. But, you know, I shared a tweet, I think it was yesterday. You know, just again to keep myself informed, I had a look at the Soro Base numbers. And Soro Base, um, for anyone listening that hasn't seen the tweet, they record the number of managers making their first investment <clears throat> and the number of managers selling their last card. There are a few known unknowns in this. You know, one, we don't know how much the investment is in or out. You know, we could have, for example, uh, Medi selling a 50 ETH gallery is not equivalent to you know, one manager coming in and spending yep. eight euros on a, on a limited card, for example. So that's unknown. What's also unknown is, you know, people that are maybe in the camp of de-risking. You know, they have sold, they have reduced their exposure to the game, but they're still keeping a foothold in it. So there's aspects of this, like the, the full picture is not there, but what is undisputed is that so rare is acquiring users. So rare is also acquiring users at a faster rate than they did before the introduction of the PAM. Paying users. I don't know about yourself, Josh, but I didn't come into this platform and drop twenty thousand dollars on day one. You know, it was it was a slow process of learning the game and feeling more confident with it. So yeah. I suppose the question is: Was a prem value pump ever realistic? Because I don't think it was. Like I, I just don't. I think at the the level of maturity the game is now, the supply that we have. Also, like Sora, you know, Sora hasn't, in my mind, really, really turned on the tap when it comes to marketing. I feel like there's a lot more that can be done in that regard. Possibly they haven't turned on the tap when it comes to marketing because they want growth in a more sustainable way. They don't want new users to be burnt in a Gary V style pump as we saw in the past. So, yeah, I don't know. I think it's interesting. And in in obviously, yeah, you and I are in a quite similar point of view on this, but I do feel that there's potentially a mismatch on expectations and, you know, it, it, it for me, I, I do see a recovery. I, I don't know how long, and I would not care to hedge a guess as to how long that recovery will take. But the fundamentals of the game in terms of financial backing that Sarah have and the number of users that they are acquiring, um, both unpaid and paid, because you know you will have that onboarding funnel and the time taken to convert a user from being a new user to a paying user. Um, again, an unknown, but that will happen. There will be a time period that on average will take a new user to convert to a paying user. There's fundamentals of the game that I look at in the data very objectively. And I think because I don't have that, that personal circumstances that put a pressure on the need to sell anytime soon, I feel that I can separate emotion from this and look at it quite rationally and look at the numbers and you know, call out what do we know, what don't we know. And actually, although there are unknowns and plenty of them, I feel from what we can see and what the sort of known aspects are, so Red still looks like a healthy platform. It looks like a healthy business. Card values don't currently look as healthy as they were two weeks ago, <laughs> but is that the final value they settle at? I, I'm not sure. Like time will tell on that one, but I appreciate yeah. that was like a monologue. Like, thanks for coming to my TED talk. Uh, <laughs> your perspective. Uh, yeah, I think this is quite. I think the fear is that this is like the new normal. That like prices either continue to go down or they stop here, and like, or you know, that, that you know, it'll just become a game of undercutting until you can sell a card, etc. 
And I think like people are scared that, you know, the price they paid back for their cards a month, two months ago, they'll never get back. And that, like you say, they're they're sort of hedging that they'll they'll sell now before it goes even lower. And I just think that that logic is just kind of flawed. I think, you know, we've had ups and downs in in so rare before. I think, um, you know, it was a long time ago now, but previously there was a big dip in the market and Powell, like a big Euro dip, uh, essentially. And Powell bought like, probably because it was end of season or something very logical. And this dip certainly hasn't been very logical. Um, apart from the, the points you mentioned about maybe some, some, uh, forecasts on the premier league that you know might have what might have done so rare cards but last time when we had a big dip in market values like powell took on a load of investment and bought a load of cards and then like came out rosy selling them all for for a big profit the next time the market you know bounced back up and um yeah i just think that that you know it i, I just can't really see everything just keeps carry on going down and down and down and i think some people will say about the part of your when you said about, um, you know, if you can keep yielding from your investment, then, you know, it's not the end of the world. And some people will say, oh, but if the cards you're winning are also decreasing in value, then this, you know, this creates a decreasing trend in values. But, you know, I just, there will surely become a time, and this is based on no statistical evidence, but just my own feeling, where card values do rebound in terms of new users coming in and um, when they get, this influx of supply out from the Premier League and start minting one per week like they normally do, you know, of those cards in in rare and I'm not quite sure how many they do in limited. Um, but yeah, you know, at that point, after we've had, we have had this dip, you know, surely there's a plateau or, you know, that something that, that happens where we get a more positive market. Um, and if that's the case, then yeah, you know, the people that bought now will be, will be a lot happier with, with what they've purchased. Um, Absolutely. And I think as well, yeah. it's like, at, at what point do people look at it and go, okay, wow. So if we look at the pricing trend over the past couple of weeks, Gil, I think last sale dropped down to like one ETH. Uh, Sassinia has dropped down to like 0.5 something. This midweek coming up, if you win or star rare, you get 0.5 ETH. At the weekend, yeah, the ETH payout it's closer to one ETH. At what point does Gil, Cecilia, and all the like guaranteed summer smashes, do they have to drop for people to go, hang on a minute, I could build a team that's capable of winning a division here. And, you know, yes, I can yield cards, but also that top-end ETH will attract certain users and then you know that will have an impact on overall market value because what seems to be happening at the moment is like you've got you know your Mbappes and Messi's and Neymar's that are almost like a barometer you know if we, if, if if Mbappe you know if we have a couple of users undercutting on Mbappe then suddenly everyone's everyone's adjusting the prices of, of everything else based on the most expensive cards on the platform. Or a nice bit um, of credit card fraud. You know, that's always Well, I was about to say, I don't think that helped because I think that <laughs> induced further panic. People went, oh, someone's just sold Mbappe at 3 ETH. Then you realised it was someone, um, yeah, let's just say they didn't purchase Mbappe with their own money. <laughs> um, so I think there will become a point where people will start looking at the value of cards and what they can win with them both ETH and other cards and say, okay, actually, you know, like the return, potential return on invest, my investment here is, is pretty good. You know, I, I've, I, it's quite interesting in, in a couple of the discord groups I've been looking at is it's really interesting. Like the two camps of people, like I actually was seeing conversation earlier where, where some people were celebrating the drop. I think because they were like, oh, well, it gives yeah. me a chance to upgrade my team. <laughs> like, see, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna buy in. I'm gonna get myself a Sassini. I'm gonna get myself a Gill. Who, you know, last year was selling for for prices that they they couldn't afford. So, and this is why I think, like, if and when it does turn, it turns back into the other direction reasonably quickly because people will then look back at the all time high values of these cards and say, oh, damn. Um, obviously you need more people to do that in limited than in rare. So I do wonder what, whether there'll be any difference in the scarcities as a result. 
of this because I think that's sort of fascinating when you look at, you know, like what was interesting is looking through my gallery value is a lot of my limiteds are, you know, down. A lot of my rares are down. A lot of my super rares are not down because there hasn't been any sales. <laughs> so yeah. I, I think that like, there's some interesting, um, you know, sort of market aspects of that. And then, and, you know, when we sort of look at what a potential recovery might look like, where does that recovery come and what what is what gives people confidence because i feel like if Sura were to come out this yeah. week or next week and say hey look you know we overshot the mark with ETH thresholds we're going to add xp for example yeah and the xp is like a small change that gives you a better chance of hitting 250 with a 240 cap how quickly does that inspire confidence in the market because I think, like quite a few people that I've seen, that there, there seems to be a lot of frustration around that. Um, the old threshold discussion. underpinned value, and now they take yeah, it away. Yeah, absolutely, and it, and it also injects a lot of um, it injects a lot of value into the market. Like, I know I can't speak for everyone, but I've personally never <laughs> withdrawn an ETH threshold. I just keep on stacking them up and then buy a card that I want to buy. Um, so there's definitely an aspect of that. Um, that ETH being injected into the economy. Obviously, not everyone will do it, um, but there's a factor there that I think keeps things moving, influences car prices and liquidity in the market. Because if there's liquidity in the market, undercutting doesn't happen, right? Yeah, yeah. That, that's, that's where you know that's where prices end up starting reducing is because there's not enough people with confidence to to buy and increase the liquidity in the market and more frequently, more frequent purchases, reduce the aspect of undercutting because every time there's a new sale, it sort of resets expectations for people. And if you're not making a sale and you keep on dropping, like, I, you know, I saw some of the managers that were selling off individually, like the pretty aggressive cuts. Like if you look at um, expired listings on Soro data, you can, you can see how people have stepped it down, stepped it down, stepped it down, trying to get a sale quickly. Yeah, um, because of that induced panic. So, yeah, it's it's fascinating. Um, you know, I don't profess to have the answers, but I I am intrigued watching the behaviour, and I and I do feel that <clears throat> there has been a, an overreaction in in certain aspects. Um, so. Yeah, I think it's I think it's interesting. I'm not. Yeah, I'm not personally too concerned. And I think, again, it's just down to that point where I'm not really looking to sell sort of my gallery or really too many cards. I did actually sell a, a bulk deal to Roddy Boss with like 10 rares last week that I won mainly just because I wanted some money for him to, to buy something else, you know. So I think I'll still continue to do deals like that in this market. And especially, I think, if you can raise ETH in this market and you want to buy someone, it's it's a hell of a lot you know, more favorable than it, than it used to be. You know, I was looking at picking up a Sebastian Quattas who, um, like next six fixtures for sporting are just absolutely ridiculously good. Um, so yeah, I was looking to pick him really up. Good, yeah. And I was like, oh, this is going to set me back like 0.3 ETH or something. And then he's like 0.13 for a rare, uh, which Damn. he's got an L5 of 66. I mean, I, and yeah, I just, um, I just think I think you're right. I think if we do get a bit of a turn on these, then we could start to see. I think it'll only take a couple of sales above the floor before people start going, "Oh right, you know, we're going back up now, and this could be the bottom." And you know, they don't want to don't want to miss out on that. Um, that's it. And so, I think people are looking for the bottom at the moment. Mm. That's what the, that's what they're sort of waiting for. Like, and you know, I went I went out and bought um, I bought a card like two days ago. I bought Joe Felix. Because I was looking oh, yeah. at Joe Felix and I was like, okay, Chelsea, much like uh, Sporting, have a ridiculous run of games coming up. Um, also, this week, under 23, um, particularly with Vinicius Jr. suspended, really not that that many under 23 forwards. Um, Chelsea play Dortmund, um, which is not the easiest of fixtures, but I, you know, I get confidence that um, Could be you know, nice. Dortmund... Yeah, Dortmund, Dortmund don't really keep that many clean sheets, so I feel there's an opportunity there for him to score. And the way I sort of looked at it is I was like, okay, Jao Felix at 0.6, what's 
what's the sort of comparables around, you know, for other potentially elite um, under 23 forwards? Um, there's not many around at that price. Can Joe Felix immediately improve my team? Yes, he can. Particularly this midweek, where I actually had like four really strong, like really strong cards relative to the, what else is happening and who else is playing, and just completely lacking forward. So I was like, okay, cool. Like this, this is this is a nice pickup for me. I'm also looking at, you know, so that opportunity to 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 pick up those elite cards. So you know, I've listed a bunch of limited cards for sale this week because I see an opportunity to strengthen my rare sides. Like I am and have always been stronger in rare than I am in limited. I my limited gallery tended like it basically got a bit bloated because I was playing limited specialist and I was regularly winning and I was right. sort of enjoying that aspect of the game. Um now that the gameplay has changed, I, I sort of look at my gallery and where my strengths are and I say, okay, well actually I'd, I'd probably want to focus in a little bit more on rare because that's where some of my best well that's where all of my best pieces are don't get me wrong like i've got a couple of strong super rares but all of my strongest cards are in rare so you know for me i you know i'm sort of looking at that back of status and thinking okay well that that is you know the guy's elite and particularly because i've got dino hotic joining trabant spore in the summer uh-huh. you know back of status as, as a long-term pickup for me he would would really make sense for my gallery and I think that's how I'm looking at it is if I can liquidate some of the cards that maybe aren't making lineups and can consolidate into a player that can strengthen my lineup, then that's something that I would like to do. Um, You know, I'm actually trying to get uh, back status now. If I can get him in before the deadline, he's going straight into a midweek side because they're playing FC Basel, who've been... Ah, uh, yes. It's pretty inconsistent this season, let's be honest. Um, so, you know, you've really got that aspect to it, and I think that's how I'm looking at it. The other thing as well is I'm arguably stronger in the summer, um, yeah. particularly with some of the moves that I've made recently, like picking up uh, Juan Brunetta. I'd sign, you know, I picked up some Argentinian cards, so I've got like a nice River Plate defensive stack. I've got Gill coming back online. I've got Cecilia coming back online. I've got a bunch of other pretty decent America forwards like Savarino, Araujo. I, I'm not giving up. No, this is this is yielding season. You know, <laughs> like summer summer's where I tend to do quite well. So I'm I'm still really excited about that. And now I'm looking at it and going, okay, maybe I can, maybe I can make a play at, at under 23 rare per row. Because last last season I didn't really do that well in it with the summer. You know, I had um, a couple of players, but they just never really locked in their first team spot. So, you know, I'm looking at it now and going, okay, well, if I can if I can make some sales and, and free up ETH to to make some move for some really big pieces that really like allow me to really lock in and consolidate a rare and rare pro, then I, you know I sort of see that as a buying a buying opportunity, and that's sort of why I reacted on Felix because. I was like, I, I feel that Felix could improve my lineups, particularly with the run of games they've got. Like this weekend, they play Southampton. Southampton at home, like I'm, I'm running the full Chelsea stack, baby. Barrio Chile, Enzo, and Joe Felix. Like John Nellis, eat your heart out. Like, <laughs> we're there, we're there. Um, but yeah, I think I feel that there will be more managers like us that are sitting on the sidelines watching watching the price movements and that they will be happy to to make a move if it strengthens their team at a time that they feel right um the question yeah. is you know when's roxy gonna buy some more because Roxy's well already he's spent a few on Kimmich, so you know yeah um, it's things like that as well right it's like if you if you start getting to a point where you know someone like roxy goes well Kimmich was selling for a lot this more is than too that cheap ago. yeah it's just too cheap I'm going to take that. Um, you know that that might inspire one or two others to to do the same, and then suddenly you've got that element of floor like establishing itself. Um, maybe that will be the new normal. Maybe that will be a jumping off point because people start having that FOMO aspect, particularly in like with the elite elite rares. Yeah, because people are going to look at the elite rares and go, "Damn, not that many of them." Like 
Kimmich, I think Roxy Watt I now owns like 5% of all Kimmich's in existence. Yeah, he's got like 15, hasn't he, I think. Yeah, so, you know, there will be a certain element of like, okay, well, I don't want to miss out. I don't want to miss out on this boat. I want to I want to get that card. Um, I think particularly managers like yourself and I have been around for a while. Like we, we have a really good understanding of who the best cards are. We have a good understanding of which cards would slot nicely into our galleries. So I think there will be an element of acquisition. When that happens... Um, I don't know, but yeah, I think I'm definitely in the sit tight, observe, but keep a lookout for buying opportunities is probably how I describe my current sentiment. Yeah, I mean, I'm just looking at game week 351 now, which is the absolute holy grail for me. Um, I get Zenit back that weekend. so And they've got Nizhny Novgorod at home, you know, and they beat a team in Dubai, I think, actually, today, 9-0. So they're clearly feeling good. So, um, so yeah, I'll get them back. And Celtic also play St. Johnston on that game week as well. You know, just all... Challenger know, Saint... scores are going to be sickening that week. <laughs> yeah, St. Mirren, actually. Um, but, yeah, that is that is going to... And, yeah, so, you know, I'm just... I'm waiting for that because, um, yeah, that'll be... I can run my Unastall in goal uh, Zenit stack in Challenger Pro that week. So, yeah, that'll be very nice. That'd be very nice. So yeah, I'm definitely you know I'm not doing anything before then, at least apart from maybe buying a couple of defenders. I seem to be really light on defenders, um, which is why I was looking at Quartas. Um, I might, for some reason, Bruno Pekovic's floor is still really high, or it was yesterday. If it is now still, yeah, it's oh okay, yeah. So the last auction went for point one four two. Damn, I should have taken the deal that Power offered me yesterday. Um, but uh, I was going to trade him for a Bukuma and Martin Zindi when they come back from injury because um, I have Matt Ryan now. But yeah, I, you know, um, I, yeah, I'll just I'll wait for that game week and yield there. And I've got Russia up until I think it's the third of June this year, which is incredibly late. Um, yeah, it runs right the way through, doesn't it? And then they're back like the second week in July. So, yeah, this is what so I'm, I'm really excited for about is for that like golden period of rewards. Um, yeah, there's also right. been a you know bit of confidence in the latest survey statement that that J League license is not dead and yeah. that they're still in negotiations because you know when you get J League, K League, MLS all coming on, that's a ton of licensed teams and that bolsters out the prize pool and you know this is like for me we're coming into like the best time of the year for so rare prizes and yeah. I fully intend to capitalize on this opportunity um, yeah I'm looking forward to the dream running my river plate defensive stack with Gil Sassinia I'll be there dueling with your Celtic Zenit stack <laughs> Actually, you know what? Stay in Challenger, Josh. Don't come to Global. It's not yeah, good. I'm going to have to put the Celtic stack in All Star that week. Actually, what a shame! What a shame! I'll you just what... remind me what week that is, so I can go into America. Three, five, one, the third of March. Right. Um, I'm going to I'm going to play America Rare Pro and America Super Rare that week, just to avoid <laughs> the the battering that Celtic and Zenit are going to dish out. Yeah, that should be good fun. Uh, the only other thing I just want to mention is like. That we do, we do still have cards selling for obscene amounts of money. The Kimmich unique went for what was it, sixty-eight ETH yesterday? Yeah, sixty-eight point four to JR Duke. Him and Anton Black battled it out. Um, and yeah, I just I don't think like, that's, that doesn't seem terrible to me. Like, I know his rares down, boat loads. Yeah, I think as well. I think that was a buy signal for. Um... Roxy on the Kimmich yeah. rare rares because you looked at the multiples between the rare and yeah, the unique. It's like and you're like, 24X and also, and also the super the rare. rare, like a Kimmich super rare sold a couple of days ago for 15 ETH. Yeah, so well, you're probably looking that at that, and you know, that, that sort of multiple on the rares just dropped too far to the point where they've gone, All right, yeah, cool, I'll take some of these. Like, because when it rebounds, Roxy's making yeah. bank. I still, yeah, I mean, he's he's 28, isn't he? He's, he's still probably got like four years at Bayern. Yeah, and he yeah. doesn't have a move that kills him as well, right? That's no, why, yeah. that's why yeah. his his, his um, value is so high because he's already he's already there. Like, he, he's doing it in a top league, in a top team that has Champions League, you know, yeah. 
Yeah. His form, to be honest, his form hasn't been great since the World Cup. So, you know, oh, if he I regains mean, his form, then suddenly everyone's going to be diving back into him, knowing what he is capable of. So five wise, he's he's not as good as Wendell, you know, who I have two of. So, well, there you go. who's the real winner? Yeah, I'll be right back. I'm just going to check Wendell and Malcolm's floor. I might need to uh, Wendell's get myself like back into seven. Challenger with a vengeance because I'll be honest, my oh, yeah. whole back and elect strategy didn't really work out well for me this season. So, <laughs> need to need to pivot out of that one and uh, address. So. Yeah, I don't. Uh... Oh, it was actually a Malcolm that went for 1.1 just a couple of days ago. I mean, and this is the thing. Like, I think one thing that is maybe slightly concerning to me is we aren't seeing the bounce on the um, America and RPL cards, which you would normally see at this time of year. But um, but I think, you know, you've already mentioned just the influx in supply on the Premier League cards has just sucked so much money out of the rest of the cards on the platform, isn't it? But okay. I just, you know, once people have bought their Premier League cards, they're you know, there's there's going to be a point where you've got the Premier League team that you want, right? Or the, cha- you know, whatever, your Champion Europe team or what have you. Yeah. And then at that point, you know, then what do you do? You you know, you start putting pieces around them, which mean you can start winning those Premier League cards or those smashing mm-hmm. cards. So, yeah, you know, I think, I think the influx in new users is positive. And although they are probably, in the main, low-paying or free-to-play customers, there will be a point where some of those low paying or free to pay customers turn into paying or premium paying customers. And, you know, at that point, you know, I'm, I'm confident, I'm hopeful that we can see some U turn in the market and it starts to go back up. Yeah. The thing that I, I think will have a bigger immediate impact is if the sentiment of existing users changes. And the reason I say that is because if you think about it from a business perspective, people who have already deposited to the platform in the past, it is typically easier to generate revenue from customers who have already generated revenue in the past than it is to convert an unpaying user to a paying user. So then the reason I say this is because there's going to be a lot of managers on the platform who know how much Kimmich used to sell for. They know how much Neymar used to sell for, how much Gil used to sell for, Cecilia used to sell for. If they, if there is a bottoming out of value and it looks like the, like the floor is in and we've sort of hit the bottom of that pricing value curve, I imagine the, the the influx predominantly or the first influx of cash and money will be from existing users who think, don't want to miss out on this. Um, this is an opportunity to strengthen my gallery by the players that I've maybe always aspired to, but didn't have the ETH for at the time or didn't feel comfortable paying X price. If last sale on girls won, right? Yeah. If the next sale on Gill is 1.1, then in my mind, we see 1.3 before we see one again. Because as soon as it turns and people look like it's hitting the bottom, yeah, I can imagine there'll be a plenty of deposits from existing managers because of that factor of just understanding what those cards can do. If you're like, think about it, if you're a new manager that's come on board because of the Prem marketing and you see Carlos Gill coming through auction, you go, that guy. The one that was at Villa? No, no, no chance, no chance. <laughs> Whereas all these existing managers are going to go, Gil? Yeah, no, PSU is always, every week he's talking about that, lad. I think he was selling for four ETH last summer. Yeah, all right, cool, I'm getting in on that. Um, like, I think there's just like this this dynamic that, that's going to be fascinating to watch, but I think it's a increase in lifetime value from current users that will turn the market quicker and then you'll see this sort of longer tail impact of newer users converting to payer users increasing their lifetime value becoming more sticky stepping out of prem because like you said a lot of the prem users are coming in because they want prem cards yeah you know if you come in and someone comes in and said oh i'm really looking forward to get harry kane and son and you go 
have you considered Cecenia and Kim Day One because they <laughs> score roughly the same amount of points? Um, they're probably going to tell you to politely fuck off. Um, but play the game for long enough and you're going to go, hang on a minute, Kim Day One's 0.2 ETH and he scores the same as Son and he's five times the price. Maybe I should grab myself a Kim Day One. Like th there will become that, but that doesn't happen overnight. Like you need to have this discovery phase where new users understand the game and understand where the value is and how they can strengthen their team, how they can play. You know, yep. some managers might not want to play with K League at all because you know they want to play with leagues that are familiar to them. Not everyone is the same. What I do think really helps, and I know this is it's like a, a wild card part of this conversation, is uh, MLS being on Apple TV. I think MLS being on Apple TV will have an, an impact on users wanting to play with MLS cards because the games are going to be far more accessible and you can actually watch, you know, like you said, you know, you didn't enjoy playing Champ America before because you yeah. couldn't, watch, couldn't watch your players, yep. right? The fact that MLS streaming and coverage is now going to be far more accessible and they're going to have like a match of the day style show on Apple TV that you can watch the highlights on. Um I just think that's going to make users more engaged. And what will might happen is when the Prem ends for summer, there might be a section of those managers that go, oh, you know what, actually, I quite like this Surrey game. I'd like to continue playing. If they are English-speaking managers, the likelihood is that they go MLS before they go J&K because of you know the, the content in those leagues is predominantly available in English. It's going to feel more familiar particularly with, you know, players like Matt Turner coming from MLS to the Prem, there will be an element more of, I feel, I think more familiarity with Premier League managers that look at MLS. But I don't think that they do that while the Premier League is still active because, you know, for them, it's about playing the Premier League. They want to play the Premier League. It's yeah. only when the Premier League is not there that they might go, hmm, yeah, you know what, actually, I might I might dabble in one of these other leagues just to you know keep me engaged in the game over the summer. And I think that's like a huge, huge marketing opportunity for SoRare is to step them in via PL and then educate on the other options. And I think like particularly as they have the full MLS license, you've got the Apple TV coverage, you've got the English language, you know, like league. I just feel that there is a massive, massive opportunity there. So like for me, I'm not getting rid of any of my MLS cards at the moment because I just feel like there is there is a potential there for increased interest in that league. Um, you know, it's just a hypothesis. Could be completely wrong, but I just think like well, if you look at user behavior and you know how people want to play the game, like you want to be sat there, you want to be sat watching your your team play, sweating every pass. You know, all not point one points. Oh yeah, was that, <laughs> was a, that a final third? A was that a final third, third pass? Hang on a minute. Was that a tackle or Opti going to randomly mark that as incomplete? Um, you know, that's the fun of the game for some, maybe not everyone, but you know, <laughs> uh, I'm just happy because uh, Edison Alvarez managed to get a double decisive. Uh, yeah, that was wild clearance off the line and last man tackle. Um, and that's going to give me a, a lovely T1 this week, which I'm super excited to open later. So, yeah, I think, um, I've got a T1 super air coming later. Ooh, Check me out, nice. Mm. You looked um, at the balls, yeah. 1.27 points off a podium in Challenge Europe Super Air. Damn. Yeah. I have looked at the pools. There's there's a few I would really like and a few absolute landmines that I would despise. But not to worry, because I can always swap those, right? If I get one of the landmines. <laughs> you got 53 minutes through the pod without talking about what. <laughs> Yeah, you can. Like, but precedent has been set, Josh. You know, I, I would, exactly. I really would feel really bad for you if you got a Vanderbilt this week for your T1. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it. Um, but yeah, I get. Um, I was more baffled that they that was the swap that you wanted. Like, yeah, Sack is a midfielder yeah. card. Yeah. Don't want that. <laughs> yeah, very strange. But you know, oh well. Oh well. I think Duke just hasn't considered the aging out of players like uh, like Donnarumma this summer. You know, Vanderbilt next season. I I will go as far as saying this now as I think Vanderbilt will be worth more next season than Saka is. Oof. Just just go in there. Hmm. I'm not sure. Unless Saka that. gets changed to a forward card. Hang on. I mean, the rare's worth more now. 
there we go. This time next year, Vander Walt's going to be worth more. Look at me, the prophecy is fulfilled. Um, I hadn't actually checked that, but honestly, when I saw that swap, I'm like, why would you want to swap those? Yeah, the rare is worth more now, the, the Vander Walt rare. Um, so yeah, that that's, yeah. The last Van der Voort sale was a 1.52 and the last Saka sale was a 1.25. So yeah, the, the rare is currently worth more, but obviously the last super rare sale of Saka was 6.69 and the last super rare sale of Van der Voort was less than that, I think. Though I can't. Uh, 4.5. So yeah, you know, it's all relative. But um, yeah, I did I think that think was not swap. Trade from odd Sarah's swap. perspective, and also like if I was in that position, I would not have been swapping at that before, yeah. considering you know Saka as a midfielder needs to basically average a decisive every other game. Yeah, game. needs to be Gavicha basically. Yeah, exactly. to be good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, I think we've maybe ending, covered ending negative sentiment. Brutal, abrupt yeah. end <laughs> um, We've maybe said as much as we need to on that front. Yeah, done. I think it's mental. Stop swapping, so right, just fix rules. Yes, agreed. Absolutely rewards. agreed. Um, yeah, I mean that is really, really cut us down there, isn't it? Um, have you got anything else? Anything else you want to talk about? That's it. Like we've come, we've so. come to our natural conclusion. Yeah. Um, hopefully, we'll be celebrating rewards uh, in a couple of hours. But yeah, Fingers I think crossed. hopefully. Um, this has been a useful and not too one-sided biased perspective that we have put across <laughs> today. But I think, yeah, to summarise for me, I'm just still enjoying the game. I'm still going to play. I'm still going to play to win. And in that regard, it has not changed. I think I just got to accept the volatility and hope that I've made the right decision. Um, but I feel happy with the decision that I've made at this moment in time. Yeah, agreed. Thank you very much. Thanks, mate. That has been the modern game. Goodbye. <laughs>